and a very warm welcome to The Real Talk. Our guest today is um, a friend of mine, a lovely man. I keep saying things about him whenever we meet in different places. I call him a good man. He doesn't believe he is. I say, oh, then you're a great one. He says, no way. But today we have an opportunity to get to know him and what makes him tick. Welcome to the show and the hashtag is The Real Talk. We're coming to you from Mithas Boutique. My name is Jackie Lumbasi. Our guest is Maxwell Gomera. He is the UNDP Rwanda resident representative. It's a pleasure to see you, Max. Thank you for having me. Good to finally get to sit down with you. It's been like a whole year of chasing. I know you've been avoiding me, Jackie. You won't get away with that. <laughs> no, no, no. Why do I feel like you've been avoiding me? No, no, no. Uh, but very kind of you to describe me in those terms. I thought you would tell the world that I'm loud. But, you know, the vast majority of people are very kind. No, but so, see, thank you. Loud, they know. <laughs> <laughs> I omitted it because those that know you, know you're loud. <laughs> Max, tell us about yourself. Let's take a trip down memory lane. Where does your story start? Where does my story start, uh, Jackie? Um, I don't know if my life is one story. I think my life is a tapestry woven of many stories. Uh, but there are some that come to mind when I'm thinking about where I started off. I was born in a neighborhood that was very deprived. Um, so when I'm doing my runs in Rwanda and I go to Nyamirambo, I go to some of the neighborhoods that are equally deprived, I relate. And when I meet people you see in those, I, they, I, I was once them. <clears throat> and uh, I see myself in them. I see myself in their aspirations because I grew up in that. But the interesting thing for me, Jackie, is growing up in those neighborhoods, it never occurred to me that we were deprived mm -hmm. because I didn't know how being not deprived looked like. You didn't know better. I didn't know any better. But also, it's a credit to my parents because I think they worked very hard to shield us from the impacts that deprivation would give us. So I grew up in that neighborhood. We had dreams. We would go down to the main streets and start fighting about the cars that were moving there. And say, oh, that's my car. That's your car. Um, and we had dreams about buying similar cars. So. Most of my memories are with my friends in that neighborhood. And as I go about doing my work today, I'm driven by a desire to make sure that no one else has to go through what I went through. Because thinking back, while my childhood was very good, I can see that my, my, my potential was limited by what I had access to mm. in those days. So it was good um, in many ways that I could go around, play with my friends, but it was also limiting in that the environment itself did not give us everything that we needed as children. You didn't see it then, but as you grew older, where you are today, now that you see it clearly. Hindsight. Yeah. With hindsight, hindsight I always think, yeah. if I had that and that and that, I might have been a different person. Or know, I might have grown up with different potential. What I'm really happy about is you growing up in such conditions and ending up where you are today. There's a story that you've told of your mother struggling to raise you and your siblings. And I would love you to repeat that story because I know it, but my viewer doesn't. And how you sold tomatoes with your mom to be able to raise school fees. That's the story of a lot of people, but when they see you in your position as the resident representative of UNDP Rwanda, they think, no, this man has had it all since his childhood. No, yeah, yeah, well, it looks that way. And, you know, tribute to my mother and to all mothers like my mother today who are trying to raise their children. You're absolutely right. My, my mother did everything she could to make sure that we had access to the basics that we needed to grow up and apply our full potential. She was a businesswoman. She sold tomatoes and other vegetables to make a living for us. 
I remember that my mother went to every bank in town trying to raise capital for her business. But no one believed her. First, she was a woman. Second, she was considered to be someone in the informal business. We have many stories like that today. Yet when I look at what my mother used to do every day, I see no difference between what she did and what formal businesses do today. You know, my mother kept copious quantities of notes on her customers. She would know that, uh, you know, on a Friday I would deliver tomatoes to Jackie, and Jackie likes her tomatoes in this way. On a Friday I deliver tomatoes to someone else, on a Saturday to someone else. My mother invented Know Your Customer before the banks did. She was very good at it. But after school, well, she had received some basic education. We were very lucky that way that in Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. we had access to that infrastructure. So she had received some basic education, but still, she was in the informal sector. But one thing that's interesting for me is after school, she would ask me and my sister to deliver tomatoes. She bought a little bike for me and a little bike for my sister, and we would deliver tomatoes. My mother invented Uber Eats mm -hmm. before Uber became a thing. So that is something that is egged in my mind that today, had my mother received the same sort of support that we give to businesses, her prospects might have been elsewhere. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And then she sent you to college. If you can briefly describe your college life. Well, you know, there are a lot of lessons uh, with college. Like many students, we're ambitious. Like many students, we wanted to be excellent. And like many students, you know, I also looked at the girls around college. Uh -huh, so did. Those, those were <laughs> things that uh, defined our college life. So yeah. if you're a student out there and you're doing any of these things, you're studying hard, you're partying hard, mm. yeah, it's normal. What, what, memory, what, what memory does stand out from your college time? And if you have any valuable lessons that you picked at that time and not any other, can share that with us. Oh, look, I mean, there were, there were a, a lot of lessons that I picked uh, from, from college. So one of my friends um, that, I, that I used to study with, and we became very close friends, Laura Banda. Um, one day she came uh, back from a field trip and said, hey, I'm going to see my, my parents for a weekend. She went for a weekend. She never came back on Monday. Tuesday, she never came back. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, someone came to my college room and said, hey, Laura has been involved in an accident and died. From that time, I learned never to take things for granted, never to take our existence for granted here because it can happen any time. And there was a small college boy, just in college, and it is hard when those things happen, but it knocks the message home. Mm -hmm. Never take your time for granted. If there's anything you can do to anyone while you have the chance, do it. If there's any good you can do to anyone while you have the chance, do it. Because tomorrow is not guaranteed. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. But hey, we also parted hard, eh? <laughs> we loved it very much. We were college students. I remember Did we you used jump to over do... Fences you know what? We used to <laughs> do... Cutting off the lights so that you can do your thing. <laughs> you know, I'm not sure that it's even... It would be legal for me to describe some of the things that we used to do in college, you know? Uh, we, we loved football in college, and I'm sure we would pack up the bus. Some students would jump and be on top of a bus <laughs> to go to the national stadium to watch football. Those things that, that uh, young boys and girls do, I wouldn't recommend it today. Now that I'm a little older, I think that was not very informed. <laughs> but, you know, no, we I, went I, through I, the I drill. So. No, I'm thinking, what's at college, really, we're allowed to do some reckless things, you know? As you say, what you say, not very informed, really, that's allowed. As, that I'm not sure. Yeah, that's allowed. But as a parent now, I look <laughs> back and I say, would I want my child to be like that? I think I would like my child to make different choices. Okay. Yeah, I would love my child to make different choices. Yeah. 
But you know, this is how life in life you learn and uh, we were lucky that we stayed within the guardrails of uh, decency. Yeah, and that's very important. You try it. You need to stay. Well, this is the thing, um, Jackie. We always worry about, uh, there's always this debate about how do you stay within the bounds of decency. And I think that I was lucky that I had come from a family that had strong values. So even if there was a lot of noise at college, I had a sense of what's right and what's wrong. But I also grew up as a very committed Catholic. So the church gives you a sense of what's right and what's wrong. So as you navigate the noise of college, I think you need to have a sense, a framework of what is right to do and what is not right to do. So even as I described this cacophony of things that we used to do as students, yeah. it was still I maintained a sense yeah. of what's right and what's wrong. I get it. Yeah. Then uh, tell us about your first employment. You know, I think my first real job was uh, when I was asked to go to a place about 600 kilometers from Harare to develop a, an, an outgrow scheme for tea farmers, smallholder tea farmers. Um, outgrow schemes are like contract farming. Now, tea is an interesting crop. The best teas come from the top leaves of the plant, the first two or three leaves. Now, if you are a commercial farmer and you, you have a very big farm, you hire you know, contract uh, laborers to come and help you, and you pay them on how many kilograms of leaves they give you. Now, obviously, they don't have time to pick the first three because their motivation is to fill up the bag. Yeah. So they pick and fill up the bag. So that tea is not very nice. But the tea that's produced by smallholder farmers mostly the poor farmers, is the best tea. Because they concentrate on because getting the Because they have best. time to pick it up. So many large companies like to buy from smallholder farmers. But the downside of smallholder farmers is, first, they produce very little, and second, they are not very well organized as a group to deal with. So my job was to work with them to see how we can organize them into into small businesses. So I ended up creating a group of farmers, about 3,400 farmers that I worked with in a very remote area. And it became one of the most successful smallholder tea farming project uh, that, I, that, I, that I built. And that earned me the eye of some people who were interested in young people who were prepared to go out there and change the world. I was also going to ask you if that was related in any way to what you had studied in college. Because you're out there working with farmers. Did you do anything it was, related to It was that? related to that. It was related to agricultural economics. I had also done mathematics and economics as well. So um, it was related to that. I was applying uh, some of the stuff I had uh, I'd studied in, in college. But you know, college gives you the basics. What you find out in the world is very different. And College life is about giving you the instruments that help you to make sense of what you're finding in the world. In the real world. In the real world. Yeah. But also reinvent a new world out there. Because the world is not the status quo. The world is what it is because of choices that people who came before you have made. So yes, I went out there, you know, um, started working with farmers. We created a very successful outgrower scheme. I left. I went back to the capital, and a, a gentleman. Said someone spotted you. Yeah, there's a gentleman who I will forever be uh, owe an eternal debt of gratitude uh, because he gave me a chance. His name is Dr. John Hatton. He's now in Cambridge in the UK. Um, John um, found me a bit of a, a bit of a challenge as well because I never gave up. So I knew that uh, John was starting a new operation. I wanted to work in the wildlife space. Wildlife just fascinated me. But I did not have a chance to do that. And someone whispered to me that, hey, John is starting up a company that's looking at uh, elephants, because elephants were a thing 
mm -hmm. in Southern Africa at that time. Uh, so I went to John and I said, hey, I'm your guy. I, can, I think I can do this with you. You had never met him? I'd never met him. So John was a busy guy. He dismissed me and said, uh, you know, okay, come, come tomorrow. Here's my, my house. Come, I'll be at home. Um, I went there. He wasn't there. So I said, okay, I'll come back uh, the following day. I went the following day. He wasn't there. I went back again, and, and, again, he, and again. his wife uh, then said to John, John, you can't do this. Yeah? <laughs> There's a young man who's always coming here. You have to be here. Yeah? That's, how, that's how I met him. Mm -hmm. And I met John, and I made my case. John gave me a job on the day. And from that time, we created an amazing company. And we began to look at um, how elephants could be managed differently, but also how the international community was helping or not helping the management of elephants in, uh, in Southern Africa. That began to interest me. I decided I needed to go and study more. So I went abroad and began to study again. I developed, uh, we used to call them bioeconomic models for managing elephants. These are mathematical models I never know what that is. Yeah, these are models that bring together mm. price and cost data to help managers to make decisions about, about what elephants. to do with the elephants. Yeah, because elephants are an interesting... We can have another debate, discussion <laughs> on elephants. Clearly. They are an interesting species. Yeah. No wonder they attract the attention of people up and down this world. But they are an interesting species. But the good thing is I developed one of the first bioeconomic models as a young person for managing elephants. Who would have known that a boy from a deprived neighborhood in some little known part of Zimbabwe would end up doing that? Oh. So that propelled me to, to offered me more chances. What even helped you do that? Like, you know, what, what I see in you is, as you said, somebody who never gave up, but also someone who just never allowed his circumstances to stop him or determine how far he could go. So you thinking of elephants and coming up with the bio, whatever that you've talked about, how did that even happen? You know, my mom never gave up. So I guess I inherited a bit of mom gene here. Yeah? Um, and my mom would have her dish of tomatoes go into white neighborhoods. Now, white neighborhoods were a thing in Southern Africa because, as you might know, we were a very segregated community. Yeah? There were white people on one side and black people on the other. My mother would have the courage to just go into white neighborhoods, knock even if there are big dogs there, and say, hey, I've got something to sell. And I used to watch this woman and say, who are you? Huh? And I saw how her courage um, opened up things. She refused to accept that she couldn't do anything. Mm. And that is, was one lesson that has driven me around. I never, I, I, it's, it's very rare that you find me accepting the status quo. <laughs> There's always a possibility to change things. There's always a possibility. You yeah. must always leave yourself wow. the chance that you could do something else differently. So, Max, you come from working with farmers, uh, small holder farmers, then you work with elephants and create this software. Is that the right term to use? And then you end up at UNDP. How did you find yourself at the United Nations Development Program? Oh, wait, was well, it even the UNDP first or it was another agency first? It was another agency first. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, when I left Harare, I um, was hired by a, an institution called IUCN, the World Conservation Union. Mm. That was my first interaction with a, another equally, not equally, because he was far more <laughs> ahead of me, ahead of us at that time, um, a, an, an inspiring leader called Akim Steiner who was leading uh, the World Conservation Union. We worked together very well, and he gave me a chance to be his special assistant. I was quite young, and you know, I liked to do things. 
so he gave me a chance to be his special assistant. And I think he thought I could do something. Um, I left, well, I didn't leave. Akim left IUCN and went to the United Nations Environment Program. Again, he called me and said, would you like to join us at the United Nations Development Environment Program? So I remember it was the 14th of June, 2006, when I joined together with Akim Steiner, uh, the United Nations Environment Program. Again, I had an opportunity to be his executive assistant. Now, well, by the time he makes you his executive assistant, he's seen the potential you have. And then being that close to him gives you the opportunity to learn from him. As you're saying, he was way ahead of you. And just look at you, at your young age, you get to sit and walk right next to a man like that. You know, Jackie, uh, people who get to do these kinds of jobs, whether you, whatever you call them, you know, people who get to be executive assistants, people who get to be working with the CEOs, they are in a laboratory that um, you may never realize at the time that it's incredibly invaluable. But the amount of information you're processing and you're seeing how decisions are made and you're having a, a strategic overview of any organization, it shapes you and prepares you for something else that might be bigger. And I consider myself very, very fortunate. I wasn't the best brain in the room. I was just in the right place. That I managed to get to IUCN, I managed to get to UNEP, and Akim thought I could do something. So I owe him as well uh, uh, some gratitude. But he, he gave me a chance to do that. But what happened then is um, I left, I worked with him for maybe three years, two years, three years, and I said, no, look, I need a life independent of you now. Uh, then I went and started doing something else. Um, I did not see him again. And one day I was uh, reading and UNDP uh, advertises these uh, positions for resident representatives. I applied and I went for, for the course, for the training, and I did well. And, you know, I was put in the resident representative pool. Uh -huh. <laughs> and there you are, I came over here yeah. and I'm a resident representative. How did you feel when they told you you were coming to Rwanda? How much did you know about the country by the time you were getting that information? You know, I was super excited. But, you know, before that, things happened for a reason, right? Before Rwanda, uh, I had been offered Ghana. But my son was having a, a, a heart operation. And again, that's another lesson that... Uh, I wish to share with you, Jackie, because it changed me. It's, it's a moment that also changed me. I was in a meeting with my staff, and my phone rang. I looked at my phone, and it was my son calling. It was about 9 o'clock in the morning. So I looked at the phone, and I thought, oh, I'll call him back. Yeah. Uh, it can't be agent. This is my son. This is my son. I'll Your call wish. him back. Um, that decision um, was something that I regret very much because I came to find out when he was calling me he was having a problem as we later found out that he had a heart problem and he was beginning to feel he can't move so he was calling he was help. on his own yeah he was on, he his, was on own his own at own. home and he was calling me for help there was nobody it was only around noon when my wife got home from uh, work and she found him almost lying down and uh, not talking and not able to do anything. She called an amb ambulance emergency and they took, her, took him to hospital. He had emergency surgery. Uh, they called me and I just couldn't believe it. Yeah. Um, any, any more delay, we could have lost him. And that taught me something that um, 
my, the people I work with and everybody will tell you, if my phone rings, it doesn't matter who I'm talking to, yes. if I'll pick it. It doesn't matter who's calling. It doesn't matter. It doesn't I matter who I'll, you're talking to, well, it doesn't matter who's calling. I have to assume that when people are calling me, yeah. it must be important. Yes. You know, otherwise they would just not call me at a ridiculous uh, time. So it must be important. But uh, especially my, my, my children, uh, my family, when they call, well, I have to pick that. Yeah. So um, this is what I urge all my colleagues and my staff to do. If anybody is calling you in, when we are in a meeting, it doesn't matter whether you, we think the world will you end will tomorrow. You will not get offended. I will not get offended. Yeah. Pick your phone. Um, so I was supposed to go to Ghana, to Ghana and this happens. And my son had to go through surgery, so I said, no, I can't. Mm. But then... You had to be by his side. I had to be by his side, yeah. and uh, that, that opportunity went. A year later, uh, Rwanda became open. I said, that's my place. I'd only been to Rwanda for 36 hours. I flew into Rwanda. We met President Kagame and Minister Biruta, actually. Minister Biruta was the Minister of Environment at that time. Mm -hmm. Met them, and I loved the country. And I thought, you know, the President was talking at that time about, um, you know, how he was uh, strengthening his civil service and challenging his ministers mm -hmm. and giving them blackberries because he was saying, they don't, you know, you don't need somebody to do some of this work for you. Here's a blackberry. Mm -hmm. Do some of these things for yourself. And I thought... That's your yeah, sister. this is not normal. I like, I like. <laughs> this guy is way ahead I, of his I, time. I like him. I like him already. <laughs> I said, yeah. yeah. So when the opportunity came up, I said yes. I want to go work with that guy. I want guy. to go there. I want to go there. And um, so I came over here mm. in 2020, on the 23rd of um, um, November. A lot of things happened at that time. And that just speaks to how Rwanda is as a country. When I first came in, I came in at around 10 p.m. I was greeted by a robot <laughs> at, the, at, the, at the airport. That was the pandemic time. Yeah. yeah. That was the pandemic time. And that was uh, <laughs> something else for me. I thought, you had never seen that anywhere. Who are, the, who are these people? <laughs> Well, you know, I was coming from, from, from London yeah. where, you know, we were just getting into a queue and, uh, and, and getting on a plane. I, I get into this country and there's a robot. Yeah. I thought, okay, <laughs> okay, I, I, I Welcome can... Welcome to Rwanda. I, I, I can <laughs> deal with this. I can, I can get used to this. And well. the following day, you know, I just arrived on the 23rd. It was a Thursday, I think. 10 p.m. Yeah. The following day, uh, it was a Wednesday or Thursday, I can't remember very well. Um, but the following day, 10 a.m., I was at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs presenting my credentials. Up to today, it remains the fastest presentation of credentials that I know of in the UN or diplomatic circles. The yeah. fastest. Not Only Rwanda can do that. Yeah. Only Rwanda can do that. And the following day, after that, I was on the way to Amayaga, where we launched one of our biggest projects, Greening Amayaga, with Minister Mujawa Maria. Mm -hmm. And that remains memorable and etched in my heart today. On the way to Amayaga, I remember that I stopped at a place and I wanted to use a bathroom in one of the rural areas. I went in there. They were very welcoming. They offered me their bathroom. I came out and I said, perhaps I need to do as much and best as I can to make sure that we make lives better for, for people, people, like people like this. They are very welcoming. Mm. They, they don't know me. I'm a stranger. They're very welcoming. But if you look at their conditions, it's the conditions I'd grown up in. And I thought, no. We have to do something, yeah? But also, at that time when I came in, Jackie, I must tell you, I came in as a grieving father. 
I had just lost a son uh, to the pandemic. Um, so life was very difficult for me. Um, and I was looking for somewhere I could call home. Um, you know, many people lost loved ones in those times and sometimes when you hear that somebody else has lost a loved one, the real impact of it doesn't hit you until you lose one of your own. Now that's something that I, I will probably never get over. Yeah. Um, keeps coming back. Keeps coming back. Every time someone on your team, a friend, a colleague loses a loved one, yeah. your wound yeah. comes fresh. Yeah. Mm. But I, I must tell you, I found people in Rwanda who helped me to get over some of the, the biggest traumas that come with losing a child. I mean, no, no parent should have to live to, to, to bury, bury their, their children. Child. Yeah. Mm. Um, so that's something that... Did you move I to one to, of your family, the rest of the family? The rest of the family stayed because, I, you know, like I said, my son had just had uh, surgery, surgery, a year before, heart surgery. And we, my, my two daughters, I have two lovely daughters, you know, um, were going into, into university. Um, and my son had just had surgery. So I couldn't move them uh, at, the, at the time three years ago. So, so you move, you're still grieving when you move into this new country. That's right. And then you needed a supportive that's team right. for you to go through. Mm. Yeah, but sometimes, Jackie, you play the cards you're dealt, okay? A, a chance comes and you take it. And uh, this is a country that I, I wanted to work in. Yeah. And that opportunity, I wanted to take it. And um, also, it offered me an opportunity to move away. Um, and, and support the family in a different way. Yeah. yeah. You know, Max, you are a very compassionate person. Like, in the way you do things, you deal with people. And for some of us, some of our personal experiences actually don't teach us any lesson. But you seem to be intentional about picking a lesson from every season of your life and from every interaction. I'm wondering, is there something that you learned along the way or did these things begin to matter when you entered the job sector and saw how these farmers were struggling when you came to Rwanda and you went to ease yourself in this home? Did they begin to matter when you maybe had the means and then you have money and you can help? Or is there something that you grew up with and nurtured uh, along the way? Because it's very evident. Yeah, you know, I, Jackie, I don't know, but, but um, one of the things that I also saw from my parents is they used every opportunity, uh, every tragedy to pick lessons from it. And this is something that I, I, I also found helpful and a way of coping actually with the insanity that life can become at, at, at times, yeah? Um, you can spend a lot of time crying about the lemons that life has thrown at you or you could choose to say, okay, what lessons do I pick from this and how do I use them as a stepping stone to shape the future? I often find it rationalizing things that way in my mind helps me to deal with the insanity that life can become sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, now, I suffer from a very rare condition called glossopharyngeal neuralgia. Now, glossopharyngeal neuralgia is a condition that affects the ninth cranial nerve. You know, out of your brain, you have 11 nerves that control everything you're doing, including smiling at me like you're doing right now. <laughs> There's one nerve that's helping mm -hmm. you to do that. Now so there's the ninth one. The ninth one, uh, which controls what happens with my swallowing, my ear, my everything. And that one is faulty. 
Now, when it is faulty, it results in excruciating pain. In the, before the 80s, they used to call it the suicide disease because once you had it, people, the only way to help yourself was to kill yourself. Because the pain uh, was unbearable. The pain was unbearable. Mm. Yeah, in the 80s, 90s, they found some remedy that still helps, but there's still no cure for it. And I find, so I've got that. When I came to Rwanda, at the same time I'd lost my son, I got an attack. Sometimes when you're under a lot of pressure, then it comes, it comes and goes, mm -hmm. which is, we have, I'm very fortunate that it goes away. But um, in some cases, it's in some nice. cases, it stays, yeah? Mm -hmm. So when I came over here, I was suffering from that. I met one of our colleagues called uh, Josephine, and she's also very empathetic, and we began to talk about it. I said, Josephine, you know, I know that because of this, I may not have a long, as long a time to live in this world as, 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 as I would have wanted. So everything that I do matters. I'm very intentional about what I do. Um, if I'm coming to talk to you, most often it's because I think it matters. Although I like to have fun too. You know, people might think it's boring. You no, know, you're not but no, boring. No, no, no. I like to have <laughs> no, fun too. It's not boring at all. Yeah, you know, yes. but I, I'm very intentional about yeah. most things. Now, when I also say I may not have as much time, I'm not trying to be prophetic here. Mm -hmm. And people might think, well, you know, he's trying to be prophetic. I guess this is um, a metaphor for I'm aware of the limitations that this gives me. And so, whenever I have my, my relief time, yeah. I use that relief time very effectively. Because I know that after this relief time, I will have an attack and that debilitates me. So, I've learned from all those moments that, you know, when you party, you party hard. When you, you, you when you're you a work, very special being because a lot of us hard. wouldn't party hard. Yeah. Thinking I'll be gone. Let me, you know, let me just sit here and die. After all, it's already been decided. I don't have long to live. Oh no, no, but no. But you're no, doing no. the opposite. No, I do the opposite. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, oh, but also, God. Jackie, I, I, I have, I also consider myself a regular, as regular a person as anyone. So every Saturday. I, don't, I think I've told you this. Every Saturday, I, I run from Kiev, where I live, all the way into Nyamirambo, mm -hmm. uh, past the stadium. Sometimes I go to Fazenda mm -hmm. and come back. And I go back to the stadium. And I meet a lot of people in Nyamirambo. And we begin. Most of them don't know who I am. But I love, I love being with, with them. enjoy the fact that they don't know who you are. I love that yes. because they, they teach me yeah, how to speak. They, they are themselves. They, they are themselves. Yes. You know, they, they, we, they we change in order to please you. They uh, tell me this is hari hai, hai, mm -hmm. you know, all those things. And I love it. <laughs> and I, 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 I'm like one of the Nyamijos. Yeah? Yeah, like, yes. I love it. <laughs> so the, the point I'm trying to make here is sometimes in life we miss a lot more about the beauty of life because we carry on our shoulder the titles that we have. Mm -hmm. I never do that. Mm -hmm. I, oh, I try not to do that. Mm -hmm. um, because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter where you are in the hierarchy of life. We are all trying to find our way home. The question on how much you knew about Rwanda came from Joyce. I have a question from Yvette. Coming to Rwanda, did you set any goals? And three years on, have you achieved them? Yes, I did set a goal for myself. And I had the one important goal I had was I want to go to Rwanda. I want to listen to ordinary Rwandans. I want to listen to the leadership of Rwanda, better understand their aspirations, and help them to get there. I wanted to be a partner in helping people to achieve their aspirations. I hope that three years on, we can be proud of what we have achieved together. Um, any achievements outside of UNDP? That's from Anita. Yeah, we all know you as the RR UNDP, but 
Have you made any significant achievements out of work? You know, I, 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 the, the one thing that I've done as an African father, I tell you, I've outgrown my, my cultural limitations. <laughs> my daughter came, you know, and told me, I have a boyfriend, you know, and, you know, it's not an easy You felt a certain way, yeah? I felt a certain way. <laughs> I felt a certain way. <laughs> so, how do you deal with this? <laughs> how do you deal with this? Huh? But then... But you're so lucky she walked to you. Absolutely. I never knew about me. I am, I am, you know, I thought about it and I thought, if my sister had come to my dad and said, you know, hey, oh. this is my boyfriend, come, come home, hey, this is my boyfriend. Hey. How would my sister have, uh, how would my dad have reacted? But I am <laughs> so grateful that uh, Lois and I managed to overcome this. And now we are able to have adult conversations mm -hmm. with my daughter and her boyfriend. <laughs> so that for me is an achievement on its own. <laughs> I thought, who am I? <laughs> I don't recognize you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> what I mean, happened to me? That was a serious challenge. Yeah. Oh, that was it. That was that every, was every African father will relate. I think they will relate, oh, yeah. No. They, 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 they can feel my pain, yeah. Oh yes, no <laughs> doubt. <laughs> no. And then JD, you wanted to know how it was living far away from your family. How did you manage it? It's not something I would recommend to anyone. Um you know, because family love and pheromones don't travel too well over WhatsApp or over the internet or over, you know, video conferencing. You, you, they don't travel too well. Um, I made that choice uh, first because the opportunity was there, but also because my children had grown up to a certain level. And you wouldn't uh, just tell them, let's go and they come. No, 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 no. I couldn't do that. Um, it's been hard, but I've tried to make sure that every so often I, I go back. It's also, it's also expensive mm -hmm. to, to do that. So your bank <laughs> so manager might not be very happy with you if you do that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, goodness. And then, um, so your tenure is coming to an end. Share with us a memorable cultural experience that you have had. But also, when you think of the marks who came in three years ago, and the one that will be leaving Rwanda soon, yes? In case you're hearing of it for the first time, Max Estenio is coming to an end. He will be leaving the country very soon. So when you look at those two different marks, Maxes, what sets them apart? What is it that you will be taking with you back home? Okay. Let me start with the cultural the thing cultural because, <laughs> you know, one of the events that remains, uh, that is remarkable and remains etched in my mind was that my driver at the time, uh, God Live, an amazing woman, um, was my driver, was the first one in this country to invite me to her house to, for dinner. Now, I jumped at the opportunity because I wanted to know, you know, I wanted to understand who she is, how, you know, how she lives. But I didn't realize that I was imposing a super burden. Hey, because by the time I got there, the house, the yard, everything was spotlessly clean. Ooh. And the whole group of relatives and family. There was a family, welcome committee. There was a welcome committee. Yeah. They had all come. I didn't recognize the people they were coming to come. <laughs> The person, you know, there I was, I hired you a taxi, it actually. It's a simple affair. I tell you what, I no. hired a taxi. She lives in Yamirambo. Yeah. I hired, hired a taxi to go wherever, uh, to her house. But I got there, I had one, that was my introduction to Rwandan cuisine. And uh, it was more than just sharing a meal for me. I was introduced to Rwandan warmth wow. and uh, something that I lived with for a very long time. Um, what do I live with? You know, I'm a Pan-African, as you would have noticed. And as a committed Pan-African, 
home is more than just a geographical space. It is a place that gives one dignity. It is a place that gives one safety. But it is also a place where one can have the liberty to dream and the liberty to aspire. What I've found in this country is that Rwanda has all those attributes. And I've found a home here. And that is something that I, I live with. And I am glad that Rwandans have also accepted that me as one of them and uh, mm. I can always come back to home. What will you miss most? I, I made many friendships here and uh, I will miss the most the, the people the who, people. It's, it's the people that, that make. You know, we often tend to think that the infrastructure, the thousand hills, lovely as they are, uh, or the gorillas or anything, we tend to think that they are what draws people to Rwanda. Mm -mm. But actually what draws people to Rwanda is the warmth of the, the warmth people of the and the stories oh. that Rwandans carry. And that is something that first I will take with me in my heart, but I will miss a lot yeah. because I need these stories refreshed. <laughs> Ever so often, they were nourishing yeah. me, yeah. and uh, it was it was so good. Wow. So that I will miss. That I will miss nice. running to, um, you know, around the city here. <laughs> we will be back in a bit with six kills. <music> Let's have a look at Max's six kills. What do you enjoy doing during your free time? Um, Arsenal. Mm -hmm. That's my. My first love right there for, for if you think of something that I, that I like, enjoy, I, that I enjoy watching yeah. and, uh, and uh, visiting. And but you, I also run a lot. You have common with uh, Buana Pique. Yes. 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 <laughs> you know. I've, I've seen you, you congratulating see, once in a while. You see, yes. uh, I was tempted to say great minds think alike, but I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, I'm nowhere near his great mind, okay? Let's be clear. <laughs> <laughs> but I was t that was Mr. tempting. Mr. President, he already said it without <laughs> saying it. <laughs> Listen, yes. I, I thought that was a trick question because that's what I was about to say. But hey, yeah. um, listen, Arsenal. Yeah. I love Arsenal. I love running. Mm. I love writing. You know, if you haven't been reading any of my writings, I, read I don't writing know what you're yes. doing. Yeah? yeah, I love writing. But um, I also binge Netflix. Hey. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, like, I, I'm like, I'm like, hey, yeah. who are these people who, who are doing so much? Uh -huh. Because Netflix, Netflix, you know, you busy. yeah, TV is very giving nowadays. Yes, yeah. and there's a lot to choose from. There's a lot. Question you know? number two: What is your definition of leadership? And <laughs> I think I should throw in this other question: What is likable about being a boss? <laughs> <laughs> that question. You know. I think, I think we, first I must say, we find leadership at all levels. And for me, a leader is anybody who helps the next person achieve their goals. That's important. Mm. Yeah, that's very, very important. Mm. Because at the end of the day, that's what life is all about, you know? And we all we come and go. So you are in this leadership position. What are you leaving behind? That's right. Yeah. That's right. And uh, sometimes we get consumed by the details of what we're doing. Yeah. We invented lights. Yeah. Because I can see the brightness of light. But we invented it to make life better. We invented a car. We invented chairs. We invented any of these things. The goal was to make life better for the next human being. And as long as you never lose sight of what is the goal. I think you are a good leader. Mm -hmm. You are a leader. And leaders dare to dream. Leaders are curious. Leaders also are people who never accept that we can't do it better. And what's like about being a boss? 
What's likable about being a boss? Oh my God. The things you uh, get to do that you other know, people will not do. I know, I know, <laughs> I know, man. They are, they are, they are. And you know, I got that question from that braggy moment that you were having. I was bragging about being <laughs> a boss. You were bragging yeah. about being a boss. Mark. I know, Jackie. So I said, let me know. put you on the hot seat and ask you that question. You know, you, know, you can do some of the most ridiculous things that <laughs> other people feel constrained to do in a good way. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yeah. You can just come and say, well, you know, let's do this. Yes. yes. But what's likable for me is seeing how you can change lives. Yeah? How you can make other people believe in themselves how you can make other people see the potential that they may never see in themselves. But, you know, very often I've looked at many of my staff. You know, when I, whenever I start working with people, our first conversation is rarely about the details of what they do. I want to know who they are as a person, how many children they have, if they have children, how family, all those things, because it gives me cues about who they are, and what the aspirations are at all levels of the organization. And as long as I can help them to achieve their personal goals, UNDP is taken care of. Because you know, while we might fool ourselves as leaders that um, UNDP is their first love, actually their first love is probably something more mundane. Mm. It's themselves and their, children and their children and their family. And the husband and That's the wife, yeah. And rightly so, yeah. because we want human beings to prosper and persist. Since mm. UNDP might be incidental. Now, I want to harness their first love for UNDP. And as long as I can help them to achieve that potential and help them to see the best in themselves, that's very really like a boss. That's like it. That's very likable about a boss to me. Oh, I know. <laughs> Finally, what would you say to 20-year-old Max? Two or three things. First, I would say, be curious. I, I was curious, but I wasn't curious enough. And, uh, there are times when I said, I should have been more curious about that. Maintain a certain level of curiosity, even an overdose of curiosity about the world around you. Cambridge, where my family lives right now, is also the space where 23-year-old Isaac Newton lived. Now, we all know Isaac Newton for being the young man who dared to ask an extraordinary question. Mm. Why does an apple fall this way to the ground and not up that way to the sky? Mm. It is a ridiculous question, but one that is responsible for what we understand today about gravitational physics and everything that we see around us. It came as a result of that curiosity. 23-year-old young man who was curious about it and asked such a ridiculous question. <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah. sure the people around him laughed. You know? What I can tell you is that I've been to Cambridge. There are apples all over. Every person and their dog could see apples fall to the ground. But it took a 23-year-old Isaac Newton to ask that question. So be curious. As an African, be curious about the conditions you see. Be curious and say, why are we this way in 2024, 2023 mm -hmm. as Africans and not that way? Be curious. The second thing that I would say is have a lot of empathy and kindness. Our world is running short of kindness right now. The reason we see many of our compatriots being where they are is because we are not being kind enough. The reason we see the wars that we see, the coups that we see, the, everything that we see going on around the world, the corruption that we see in the world, whenever you do something corrupt, you're not being kind about the consequences on the next person. So be kind whenever possible. It is always possible. Mm. Combine your curiosity with empathy and kindness, mm -hmm. and you will change this continent. Yeah. That's what I would have told a 20-year-old um, Max Gomera. That's powerful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. My pleasure.
I have no doubt you've learned a lot from this conversation. A young man, young woman, person of age, because what I love about it is it cut across. Whatever you've been able to pick, may it serve you well, but above all, may it empower you enough to serve the next person. And if there's anything I want you to take away from this, be kind in everything that you do, everything you intend to do, do it with kindness and empathy. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. Our guest today was the UNDP Rwanda resident representative, Maxwell Gomera. Thank you.